Okay, now do we get to see the demos? Oh wait, hi! Welcome to Talk Chat Show Thing, episode 3, with your hosts, Ella VR, Vi Hart, Emily Eifler, and Andrea Hoxley. Um, very special guest, David Smith, is going to show us the new reality prototypes we haven't seen yet, and we're very excited. So if you guys haven't heard of Wearality, it's this new demo that we're going to see, um, and we're very excited because... Uh, there's been a lot of talk about field of view, and you will, we have never seen something with quite as much uh, view on the inside as this, so we're excited to show it to and you. And the lenses. The lenses no are so tiny cool. tiny lenses with that narrow sweet spot. But, <laughs> okay. Cool. So, um, a couple things. First of all, uh, that you can see over there. Uh, this is our current prototype. It's uh, for iPads. It, right. This one's not working yet, because I haven't... Uh, gotten any software on this. I just really got this uh, a day or two ago, uh, but uh, I think you'll find it's quite nice. Oh, uh, can we, can we like show the these lenses again? up to you? Yeah. go ahead. Like, see how much lens there is there. Can you tell us about these lenses? Yeah, it's a double Fresnel lens. Uh, it actually wraps around your eye. It's a curved Fresnel, uh, both of them are. Uh, and so, uh, so each side, each eye has two Fresnels, and it's like a double convergence. Uh, and uh, what's nice about it is the lens is so close to your eye, you don't see the rings that you would you can see when you're they're further away. Right. Uh, but when it gets very very close, it actually works out really really well. In fact, one of the things I like to do, you can even do this with a camera, is uh, just run one of these. Uh, let's turn that on. Okay. I love that it's orange. I know. Me too. So uh, I'm going to show a little slideshow thing here. There we go. And so you can see what's going on with the tablet. It's, uh, it's an equirectangular uh, uh, image that's running there. And I just slide this in. And you should be able to see that if I look at real close, you can kind of get a sense. Uh, what that looks like. Of course, I can't tell what the guys at home see, but when I do this uh, with my cameras, it actually works out right, really nicely. So take a look mm -hmm. at that. Oh, I'm like right in the stitching line. <laughs> I'm going to be over here now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what kind of projection do you have to use to get it to look not distorted through the lenses? Uh, it's almost a pure spherical transform. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did was I wrote a... Um, uh, a vertex shader that's a true spherical transform and okay. uh, the problem with uh, tr tr traditional projection matrices it's kind of a hack mm -hmm. you know it's it's it was designed to fit in that little space and they, they it, you know it, it works okay but it's not as you know very good for a wider, wider field of view I wanted a single pass uh, 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 transform with that and uh, and so what I did is I fixed the projection matrix to actually do a true spherical transform when it does the projection. And that works at almost exactly right for those lenses. It is really quite nice. That's why it's pretty close. So you can see a little, just a tight, slight distortion still on the edges because I don't think our, the lenses are perfectly spherical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very close and I think uh, I'll be able to fix that too. Uh, and we're actually going to get a perfect uh, transform uh, next stage. We're going to just model it a lot better. But uh, right now it's pretty good, I think. Uh, it should have been uh, pretty, pretty yeah, good. Yeah, it seems pretty good. seems pretty good. So instead of having to do all the work in the software, you can just have lenses that... Yeah. Which is Are nice. I know for Android, the, what we clearly wrote, does, the Android version just does the spherical transform and doesn't try to do any kind of fancy barrel projection because there's so many different things that you can stick a device into that I don't know what you're using it in. Right. So that really ends up being the best guess for a random arbitrary device. Yeah, at some point, you know, I think everybody can have their lens models available and it'll just sort of be a plug-in mm -hmm. uh, to it. And certainly, um, the web VR guys are looking at that kind of yeah. uh, approach. But uh, for, yeah, but for the Android thing, especially something like this where you're not, the Android device is not necessarily talking to the headset directly. That's right. So, and it doesn't know what that what lens yeah. is, how far apart your eyes are, and maybe you move them really ridiculously far apart for some reason. Yeah, try um, hyper stereo. So, is your plan to do 
is is just to do the headset and not the um, like the tablet hardware because I guess one of the things that these things suffer from is like that the tablets are sort of slow in uh, the, the motion is a little slow. A lot of it has nothing to do with the sensors themselves. It's simply the the software stack they're sitting on. Uh, so there's no reason we shouldn't be able to get 60 hertz update rates or, or better actually with with a tablet. It's just uh, a uh, good example is with uh, WebGL, uh, the, the web browser on there, it's hard coded to a 20 hertz update rate. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the reason it's done that way is because that's the way Apple does it, but there's no good reason for it. Uh, there some concerns about uh, power usage, if you go higher than that, not clear to me that's a huge strain. Uh, but in any case, uh, I think we're going to see a way of getting. I mean, it's it's pretty simple to update. Yeah, you know, get that get that uh, to go at a, at a much higher rate for the sensors. Mm -hmm. And then with WebGL, obviously, there's a lot of uh, additional rendering going on there. And if you're if you're filling the entire screen, there's no reason to do that. So I, I suspect that that we'll also see kind of later versions of web browsers that will kind of do a simple uh, single pass. Uh, with a with like a time warp distortion, mm -hmm. uh, so I, that's pretty clear. That's going to happen, and it's going to happen in the next six months to a year. So, what do you feel like is your biggest challenge right now with getting this from? Like, this is already like a really big up, um, update since when we saw it last. Yeah. Um, so, but like, what are you guys working on currently to improve your? Uh, this one we love actually. We think this is uh, this was designed for iPads, and uh, we like the fit. And we like the finish. One of the questions we have is, uh, the, this is a binocular uh, system and it's really easy to get into it, really easy to share like we're doing here. Uh, we've got some people would like to have straps for these kinds of uh, devices. Uh, and uh, our first pass, I mean, we're going to use this as our developer units and we'll probably be sending them out. Uh, over the next uh, couple months uh, for people to start creating content with it using these lenses as the target. Uh, so we expect that uh, this is what people have in the very short term. Uh, probably the actual devices uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, probably a hybrid strap, not strap, make it, one, one of the things I find is when I'm demoing it, the right thing to do is just put up your head and look around. Um, and that's, that's great, the strap is really in the way of that. So we'd like to figure out a way to sort of have it two modes. Because mm -hmm. uh, they're both kind of, they both have their usage, they both have their value. Uh, if you're watching a movie, for example, uh, it's, uh, you really want it strapped on because it's, it's just uh, inconvenient, or if you're playing a game. So that's one of the other things that we, uh, we like about this guy uh, is um, it's, it's uh, what the other thing we're looking at uh, little devices to control it here, or it may be a, um, a little micro joystick that we built mm -hmm. uh, that will just be able to plug right onto it. So you'll still be able to have full, con full control with this. Uh, alternatively, with strap, then you can use almost any Bluetooth device, including some of the devices we're building. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we like this guy. It's uh, it's nicely made uh, and. Uh, it has a nice feel, and and really we wanted something that even little kids could hold on to nicely. So this is uh, this worked out well. So oh. this is built for something iPad iPad Mini sized. This is an iPad Mini uh, uh, size, and uh, there is an iPad Mini. We yeah. And it's this was designed explicitly for for the iPad Mini. Just those slides in there, like mm -hmm. that. And, uh, so and will, you be, will you be just only having this iPad mini size and you're not? Now we're actually building some of those. Okay. Uh, next, this is a, or uh, so Androids are a little bit easier for us to work with right now, yeah. uh, particularly on the web, uh, yeah, definitely WebGL the side. Uh, I mean, it, Apple's uh, done a really good job with WebGL, uh, but there's still some things that work on the Android side. That don't work on the iPad side. Yeah, I know. I was frustrated with Apple's decision to make all the videos pop up in front rather than letting you like actually have them hidden behind so you can see the WebGL transform on your video. Yeah, I'm hoping that's a bug. No, that's actually <laughs> no. I think that's actually their design is that uh -huh. all video plays independently in their player because they think it's the more efficient way to play video. Yeah. So they always just pop up a video in your player. 
And that's, uh, that'd be, that's very frustrating because yeah, I think we do seems need to, to see. Not, yeah, it seems to not be a bug. It actually seems to be how they're doing it, and I hope they fix it. Like, I tried a couple things, and I looked into it, and I was like, this is not something I can do anything with because mm -hmm. um, that was very disappointing to me because when yeah. iOS 8 app came out, I was very excited about potentially being able to run my WebGL stuff on it. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, video is obviously going to be one of the key killer apps, especially yeah. for the lower end devices right. like this, because uh, it, it's just it is transporting when you have uh, these you know beautiful photo bubbles that uh, like like the one you're making right now. <laughs> uh, that um, uh, it's very easy to do, and, and if you have to build a player every time, it really limits access. And it's so nice just to take advantage of the web. I really think WebGL is the, the, the real future of these of these platforms. Uh, or, or the web, I mean, I, these are web devices. There's no question to me. Yeah, and we uh, obviously agree. So, yeah. so it's, it's pretty exciting to, to see. Uh, uh, it is great to see Apple's embracing WebGL now. Yeah, it took a while. Grab the iPad. I want to feel the weight of it and see how it slots in. <laughs> okay. I can't there help it. There's an iPad There's right one right there. here. There's one right here. Yeah. That's, oh, you just did it. In and out. I missed that because it wasn't like sleek and white looking like I expect iPads to be. This is an iPad? Yeah. yeah. I know technology. I don't know my eye devices. Ooh, it's got sound. It's a, it's like a little virtual IMAX. Yeah. Uh, that's a, uh, a cool underwater scene. And so the fish really pop out because it's, it's a true stereo image. Mm-hmm. I want to see, like, I want to imagine I'm, I'm like watching a movie and I just want to like Stick this on my face. Oh, I want to like slide it so it's yeah. up instead oh, of forward. <laughs> oh, that's fun. It is serious. Look at all fishes. Fishes? Yep. Yeah, it's two screens, one in front of you, one in back. So uh, it's uh, it's like um, it's a bit bigger than an IMAX theater screen. I just I wanted to make it see how 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 wide I could get it and still make it kind of comfortable and still have a good 3D experience. Mm -hmm. I think that worked out pretty well. I mean, you still have to move your head around to look at everything that's in there, just like you do in IMAX theater. So IMAX has got between 65 and 110 degree field of view, depending where you sit in the theater. And that guy's uh, obviously a bit wider. It's more like about 140 or so, 150. That's really great. I think um, being able to generate something like that where there's a, a base that's rectangular in the background and then you could actually like have this fish swim yeah. just slightly off of the screen and then yeah. back would be really <laughs> great. That's pretty funny. You could do that. That'd be very interesting. Yeah. That's a cool hack. Even if it you know, even if it was just a way to like um, it was just like a filter that you put over old movie old three D movies uh, that they you only ever saw in theaters that you could now watch in your headset and they could you could just add like a little bit of CGI to make things yeah. just slightly well, project out of the screen. It's sort of like when IMAX uh, the intro used to be they show you this little video thing playing at the center and then they zoom in and all of a sudden you're like this huge screen. So it was like, now we start with a huge screen and we just let the fish go off the side. Yes. Like, oh, what's going on? That'd be awesome. That'd be fun. Yeah, it's just interesting. Have some little fish bots dynamically. Yeah, I think you can get much closer to the cameras and, yeah. and it'll work. You might be looking at the side of it though. Yeah, I think That's this was not the side because I saw color, but I'm not 100% certain. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little hard to see with that. And um, really close. how does this new one address, like, I guess the, the small problems for me with this headset is that there's, like, there's a little black arc on the, the sides and the bottom yeah. from the, the transform. This is, uh, since the iPad's a little bit bigger, it's not as uh, noticeable, um, but it's still there. Part of it is those lenses were designed for a, a bigger field of view than we can get with the tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just still uh, so you just need bigger tablets? Uh, a wider tablet would be nice, actually. That would make a, a bit of a difference. Uh, the ones we use um, in the lab, uh, we actually have two HD screens, one for each eye, mm -hmm. uh, the basically phone screens. And that's optimal. That's what that was designed for. Uh, the problem with that one is a bit expensive. And yeah. You have to have the, uh, the screens. You have to have all the electronics. We thought it'd be really neat to get a, a low-cost device like this uh, to be able to, um, um, you know, get people to start playing with, uh, you know, a really immersive uh, experience like that. Because yeah, the lenses are um, 
a pretty big differentiator, as you can tell. I mean, it, it's uh, they're kind of off the scale uh, of what's possible today. Right, and it's, this seems like a lot of the work in this is going into the lens, like a lot of the design goes into the lens, and then like this, the, this holder can be adapted to tablet sizes as they increase. That's right. Yeah, right. And we're looking at uh, another, actually another design. Um, what's that? Did I bring that box? So let me get this. Um, I didn't put it in there. We're missing a box somewhere? Oh no, it's right here. Um, did another design that uh, works with my phone. Oh, nice. That's a oh, excellent. early prototype. I love looking at early prototypes. They're so. I mean, there's like two layers of lenses. Yeah, so it's yeah. the same. You said two Fresnel lenses. Two Fresnels on each side. So this is what the lenses look like in parent in profile. And. Uh, yeah, I really like that guy. And uh, let me see. Actually, actually, the, this one works great with uh, cardboard. Let me see if I can find that. Um, Are you guys the only ones doing this like uh, double lens idea? Because I feel like most um, of the headsets probably, are, are just so, using like... Probably, I got a patent on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like you guys have the coolest lens technology of anyone who is out there. Yeah, well, this came out of Lockheed Martin, uh, where I'm senior fellow and chief innovation officer. And um, so here, here's uh, uh, the cardboard app running Google Earth. Okay, so it's the Google uh, cardboard demo. And it, this is... It kind of works nicely. It's obviously nowhere near as, as wide this one is, but it's still pretty nice. Uh, you can look around. Somebody seems really quiet with the noise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> almost, uh, yeah. The movie, or it ended. Or I, uh, we turned on the sound. So. Yeah, I like the... Um... <laughs> This is a great solution to me because in Google Cardboard, the lens is so small and so and it's not perfectly aligned oh, yeah. with my eye that yeah. it's impossible for me to see 3D in Google Cardboard. Well, a, but this is there's a couple of nice properties. One in particular that's great about these lenses is the exit pupil is the largest uh, in the world, so it's extraordinarily forgiving uh, depending where your 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 pupil is. Your IPD is uh, doesn't kind of matter at least on the hardware side. So we can do fixed lenses without having to change the lenses out. It's mm -hmm. just very, very happy to do that. Uh, you might have to change the virtual image, the, you know, the, the image on the screen left and right, uh, you know, it's expanded, but, but you don't That's have to That's a much easier lenses. solution than having to do <laughs> adjustable yeah, lenses. and it's cheaper and, uh, but the nicest thing though is you notice it's, it's, it's also in focus everywhere, like I said before, so you look up there, up there, mm -hmm. it's in focus. Um, and one of the key things um, uh, is, uh, especially in usability, when you're when you're using um, a um, uh, a narrower field of view, it's a pretty uncomfortable experience. Partially because you're having to track a lot uh, to find things, uh, find targets, uh, and, and targets. I mean, just things to look at. Um, uh, good example is uh, that that's the problem we have with uh, night vision. You know, so those guys you see the films of people with night vision goggles, they're looking through a soda straw and they're having to scan around a lot mm -hmm. yeah. to be able to figure out what's going on around them. And even then, uh, they often lose, lose sight of each other. And of mm -hmm. course, for them, it's really important because the bad guys are always out in the sides. Uh, for, for this, it's really important because you're like, I can see where I want to go with my head. That's the important thing of that peripheral information. So when I turn my head, it's right there. You lock on. It's a really easy mm -hmm. motion, uh, and it's a very comfortable motion. Where if you're looking at a narrower field of view, like most of those things out there now, it, you have to do this a lot more. So it's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a 
I don't think it's just inconvenient. I think it's part of the reason people get a little ill is because of that need to track left mm -hmm. and right. Not just the tracking left and right that makes the, the small arm lenses. It's that because like on cardboard, they're not really adjustable. If it doesn't match up and it's got such a small oh, yeah. range, then people will get sick just from that before they've even really started looking because they're just like, uh, my eyes don't know how to process this. And yeah. especially, specifically with Google Cardboard, um, I've seen a lot of people have that problem because I mean, it was a cheap cardboard box demo, and it, it was spectacular. And like, it's spectacular, though, <laughs> and it's really spectacular. But I think if you're expecting it to like be perfect, obviously it's not, and it shows a little bit on things like that, yeah. where it tends to make people more sick than most other uh, headsets that you might want to try. That's right. And you know, you can't adjust the things, and they're like really assume they your eyes are about this far apart, and if your eyes are the right distance apart. And then it will look reasonably good. And if they're slightly off, the more off they are from what their expectation is, yeah. the more likely you are to get sick. On the other hand, I, I think they're doing a great service, first of all, educating people about the, these things. And the other side is doing some really neat software right. platforms Right. I mean, for I think us. Google is more about the software. And yeah. software and getting it out there is something that, like, hey, you don't need to spend, you know, hundreds of dollars on, you know, uh, the latest Oculus or whatever um, mm -hmm. Project Morpheus thing to be able to do VR, you can do it with a device that you're carrying around in your pocket all the time. And I think that was something a lot of people had not realized. And it's the thing that's going to make VR accessible. That's right. I, I think that's, um, especially today, uh, we're kind of in an education phase, right? It's like illustrate what the technologies are capable of doing and the uh, lower we price we can make this, the lower the entry bar for people to start playing with it, the better, because we really want to see people start experimenting with what the capabilities are. It's sort of like the whole idea of the home computer uh, a long time ago was, hey, let's get these technologies into people's hands and let them liberate it. Uh, and uh, so having very inexpensive little CPU based computers, even though from a business perspective, it like, didn't make any sense having uh, somebody out there, probably some 19 year old kids gonna see these devices and say, I know what that's for. Because uh, the reality is, and we kinda know about games, that's gonna be pretty neat. The, the reality is the true killer apps for this new platform hasn't been invented right. yet. Um, and that was demonstrated, I mean, when, when the Apple II came out, uh, guaranteed, Steve Jobs did not know what it was for. He thought, here's a home computer, it's, we, it's, it's neat. It's, you know, but Dan Bricklin saw that and said, I know what that is, that's a spreadsheet engine. And so he built VisiCalc, and that, uh, uh, what happened after that is Apple sales tripled month over month. And that really was what defined Apple more than the Apple II, oddly enough. Same thing happened when the Macintosh came out. Uh, it's like, remember, what, it, it was neat, you could do Mac Paint, Mac Write, but what was it really for? And it turned out it was a desktop publishing engine. Uh, it allowed you to, you know, be creative with, with content that, you know, that what you see is what you get was absolutely essential for that space. Uh, happened again when the iPhone came out. Remember, uh, Steve said, hey, you can make your own apps on the web but Apple will make the real apps, and, every, and the developers said, no, no, that's not gonna work. <laughs> so the App Store had to be invented, and what is the iPhone? It's an app engine, right? I mean, and, and so uh, the people who create these technologies often are the least clued in to what their real value is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can always say games are gonna happen. Uh, that's a nature of what we are as humans. So all those devices I just talked about are have a lot of uh, uh, of, of value on the game side. Uh, in fact, no successful platform exists that doesn't support games in some way. But games are not the killer app. They're not the things that are going to redefine uh, the nature of our relationship with these devices in a fundamental way. And I think that's coming yet. Well, I, I think, first of all, I, I look at VR as a, a, a stepping stone, and even with that, a short one. Uh, of, VR is kind of a subset of what AR is, augmented reality. And uh, because once you get a wide field of view lens on the augmented reality side, we can do everything you can do on the VR side. 
but you also have this ability to extend the real world in fundamentally interesting ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, just for fun, I, I brought some of the lenses. Um, this is one that's painted black, so you can see that a little easier. But this is an AR lens that we did that is basically the same field of view as this guy. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of crazy. That's, that's it right there. You can see it close up. But the way it works is this is an asymmetrical lens. I'll get into the main point of this one. But this is an asymmetrical lens. So basically, if you have a display right about where your eyebrow is, it is in focus everywhere, just like that other, just like the Fresnels are. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens then is this is up to your eye like that, and everywhere you can see how wide a field of view this guy is. Uh, so you'll actually have a um, uh, kind of a Terminator screen that is, uh, you know, far wider than you know the existing uh, VR headsets. Uh, this is probably about a, uh, a year about a year away before we'll actually have prototypes in people's hands, but that lens works right now. But uh, it, it's it's pretty spectacular. We're very very excited about it. How yeah. are you making the lenses? Um, <laughs> you know, what special information can we know? Yeah. Actually, it's all patented, so I can tell you. Yeah. The uh, <coughs> the idea the, the problem I actually with with an asymmetric lens like that is you can't use a traditional um, uh, CAD package to make it. You can't use ZMAX, which is the standard. Um, uh, optics design tool. You have to. Um, uh, we had to write our own tool, mm -hmm. and it works this way. It's um, <clears throat> first of all, um, the, the, w one of the challenges is if I took a spherical lens, traditional spherical lens, and put it up to my eye straight on. I showed you guys this last time. I think you see your eye perfectly. It's great. But as soon as you tilt it down and you put a little display here, all of a sudden the focal length is changes across the surface. Mm -hmm. So some of that display is in focus, some of it's not. So what you need to be able to do is modify that surface so that the focal length changes across the surface. The problem is, if you think of it, if you divide that surface up into what I call oxels, optical elements, um, then... <laughs> You heard here first. Uh, I, I, what, what, what happens is um, the oxals overlap, mm -hmm. right? They're little spherical mirrors, and they just sort of this one. If I make it make this one great, this one gets screwed up. And if I make this one great, this one gets screwed up. <clears throat> and so you need to figure out how to minimize the error to, to the user so that everybody plays nice. And so what we do is uh, we break this up into oxals, and we kind of compute an optimal surface for that given point, then we divide that by a thousand, we iterate uh, literally about 50 million times. It takes about a week to compute this. And what we get then is a point cloud uh, where uh, it's in focus everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what's nice about it too is like, you think about it, well, you know, it's not perfect. Well, you're, it's better than 2020. And that's all we need to do. We, humans, are <laughs> good, right. humans are not very good optical instruments. <laughs> You're so. not building an, an, an HMD for a hawk, it's mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's how we build that. Uh, that's how we design it. So then we get a point cloud. Uh, we we uh, model that. We take the point cloud, convert it to a NURB surface, and we either send it to a, a, a 3D printer where we, what, right now we're making a mold from that, and then we do a vacuform on top of mm -hmm. it, or we send it directly to the uh, uh, manufacturing uh, to, to make make a lens like this uh, and uh, what's really cool is today is be, between 3D printing and kind of the rapid pr uh, prototyping that can be done uh, we can actually iterate pretty fast on the optics so today we can actually create a new lens almost on a daily basis and then uh, and then this takes about uh, about a week to get done and then this one is basically the perfect uh, representation of the... You can make a lens lines. faster than I can make a video. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Well, it, that, that's necessary because it's such a complex thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we first did it, uh, when we first started this, it took about a month uh, turnaround to actually, from the time we had the lens design to we actually would have something in our hands... Uh, and that was, uh, and we actually never, we knew it was going to take a month. We never actually did that because it was such a, such a problem mm -hmm. to iterate. Uh, and so we, we figured out, hey, we can actually 3D print them. 
So we, we, our first cut of these was literally printing these in, uh, 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 in, in a material that was clear. Uh, you could kind of see the layers, but we sanded it, and it actually worked out that it was good enough for us to determine whether the solution was okay. Mm -hmm. And so we did that quite a while, and then we switched over to the vacuum form because the vacuum form is kind of neat because it literally does its own kind of spline surface over that surface when uh, over that. <laughs> so that worked out great. And then we did these, so that's why we can do it so quickly now. Uh, so the the reason, though, I think when I look at it. I, Augmented reality. It's, this goes back to uh, uh, actually more Doug Engelbart than anybody you know, con had this concept of uh, augmented teams, augmented augmenting the human to be a lot more capable and allow us to communicate ideas uh, and have you know relationships that sort of transcend what we can do uh, without the computers part of it uh, and. Um, some of the projects that we've worked on, uh, you know, uh, Alan, Alan Kay and I, uh, uh, and David Reed and Andreas Robb worked on a project called the Croquet Project, which is a true collaborative 3D system. Uh, and uh, the idea of that was to allow you know, people to do very deep collaborative uh, uh, work, uh, even to the point where you could do some programming. Uh, uh, but the, the real goal of this was to have the computer as a full participant in a conversation where we're talking, computer's listening to us, and generates a simulation based upon that conversation that all of us are able to engage with mm -hmm. and interact with. And so that means that our conversation is expanded. You know, the, bra the bandwidth of the information we're able to convey and the, in the idea space that we're able to explore uh, it becomes very, very large. Mm -hmm. So what what I was after, what we've been after, was this idea of, you know, the computer having that. We did the software side. In fact, we did another iteration called the Virtual Framework, which is uh, open source as well. Uh, it's virtual.wf if you want to check it out. Uh, true collaborative platform, WebGL, WebSockets, WebRTC. Uh, you can go there right now and start playing with it. But I see that as uh, the operating system for this wearable device. Uh, so what we're really doing is not only extending our ability to communicate and collaborate, but we're also turning the internet inside out, right? So we're now wearing the internet. Uh, so I see this, uh, this AR device as, um, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly, these are going to be the next computers, but uh, more so, uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 a communication device uh, like we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, I, I think that's the real, uh, really interesting thing. It's a very intimate computer. It's going to be a computer you put on in the morning. It's sort of like you put your cell phone in your pocket uh, when you wake up and go to work. Uh, and in a sense, you've got the internet in your pocket, a little window into that world. But what would happen if you had that available anytime and almost available just by thinking about it? Uh, so that's what this would allow us to do, and so when we look at uh, where the browser is going uh, and uh, where VR is uh, today, we see this convergence of all these technologies. So the, a pure VR, like I said, is sort of a stepping stone to what's really going to happen, which is uh, a true augmented reality experience where the web is at the center enabling us to explore these ideas uh, together. So that, that's... That's it's like the, where the internet yeah. and, and mobile and, and wearable computing and personal computing is all sort of like coming to this That's right. confluence of, of the thing that you, you use it for everything and you have it on you all the time and it, it becomes less separate from the real world and computing becomes like a, literally all, more ubiquitous because it's in front of your face all the time. That's right. We're already seeing that with a phone. The, the smartphones, I don't know why we still call them phones because uh, no one uses them. <laughs> uh, when is the last time you called someone with your phone? That's right. So what you're going to see is exactly that. It's an expansion of our capabilities. Uh, I wrote a paper uh, six years ago, seven years ago, called You Will Be Superman. And the idea was, uh, you know, Superman could see through walls. Superman could... You know, had, had all these superpowers jump up in the air. So I showed you uh, Google Earth running on this thing. Mm -hmm. so you could literally jump in, up in the air. Uh, what's really cool to me is apps are like these little mini superpowers. You know, you get a new app and all of a sudden you can do something you could never do before, mm -hmm. that you could never even imagine. It's just like this overlay 
of uh, information and capability that now exists that didn't exist a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So I sort of see that's um, that's the most exciting part of all this, and that's really the goal, the end game uh, of what we're doing. Uh, these technologies, we think the field of view really, really matters. Mm -hmm. Software infrastructure really matters. The web is the center of, of that world, uh, and I think we're going to see it. Uh, uh, over the next few months even, we're going to see that the web becomes a far more capable platform for these kinds of devices. Uh, I think you'll, you may still want to go to a native platform for doing games of certain sorts, but uh, when I look at what the potential killer app is, it's going to be on the website, it's yeah. not going to be on the app. So I'm really excited to see, like, like, one thing that I think I love so much about apps on my phone is not what every individual app can do, but like how I can use, um, recombine them into making something new. Like yeah. I, I have put a lot of work into like learning how to do making different GIFs or images, like using different image software on my phone to like recombine their efforts. And I'm just yeah. really excited to, there's a lot of individual different kinds of things that are happening in VR right now. Like, you know, video and games and, and web, and, but I'm much more excited to see, like, well, when we can, when you have it on you all the time, the the, the, rec <laughs> the combinatorics of all those things is going to be much more interesting to me than, than the current things that everyone is making. And I think that's the other nice thing about the web. Uh, you think about it, it's the largest open source project in the history of mankind, and that every web page has the source available, right? And be able, and that's how I learned how to program the web. Is I looked at other people's stuff. He did some really cool thing there. How did you do that? Mm -hmm. And you can look at it and then take that and plug it into your your code to extend your capabilities. Uh, and Add the, the minification of like JavaScript and things, which makes everything run much faster. Also means that your ability to see how did they get that cool effect has uh, sort of gone down drastically because it's not readable anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's, that's too bad. Well, we have tools that can read, yeah. put it yeah. back. But yeah, it's an interesting challenge. I, I don't, anybody who's reasonable program go through that and say, okay, that's what he's doing. But uh, I, I, but it's still there. And, and I, I still see that as uh, the, the magical thing. Uh, is the web is still so incredibly open, so accessible. And, uh, and there's so many ways to address it. And certainly what we're, we'll start seeing too is the uh, ability to start combining those capabilities. I sort of see this, uh, this device as a layered thing. You know, we're gonna have, yeah, it's like, first of all, it, you know, you're gonna have this thing, it, it encompasses your entire vision, these little micro web pieces of information everywhere. There might be even a web page that's floating. You know, it might still have a 2D web page inside <laughs> this incredible 3D space. Um, but maybe it'll have that overlap that we were talking about before with the IMAX thing where that's right. <laughs> well, it'll have some sort of 3D add-on to your 2D web page in VR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. VR. so, so the, the fish swims out of yeah. the IMAX and goes over to the side. I think that's very cool. So, yeah, I, I think it's an extraordinarily exciting time, and I really think we're about to liberate the web in a way that's never been done before. And yeah. So that's why I think the web's really, and you know, we don't think of it that way because it's not quite where it needs to be. Uh, a lot of that it's artificial barriers have been put up, like the 20 hertz update rate on the uh, on, on, on the uh, sensors, or not being able to play video inside of uh, the 3D world that mm -hmm. uh, Apple's done right now. I think that's like it, like I said, I think of that as a bug, not a. <laughs> yeah, I think that right now at least they are well, thinking of it as a feature. Well, thank yeah. you so much for being on oh, our show. You. It was My so pleasure. nice to have you. Yeah, thanks for sharing all your cool stuff. And when you guys I'm are so launching it, we would love to see all your future demos. Yes. Yeah. So is there somewhere we can send people to get more information? Is Wearality.com a thing yet? Wearality.com is close, very close. Okay. Uh, by the so time soon. we're done with this, if like in a, a week, by the time we're done. I'll make sure we're ready. <laughs> okay. Then Wearality.com. 